Um, let's see some bullet points. Uh, before I joined ACORN, I failed my A-levels because uh, I spent my time writing com assembler, computer games in assembler for this, uh, <coughs> instead of studying for my A-levels. Uh, although, at the time, I thought I was a shoo-in because I'd been offered two E's by Exeter and I thought, no one can fail to get two E's. <laughs> I failed to get two E's. So it can be done. Um, but a friend of mine suggested sending off a demo tape of the games I'd written to Acornsoft. Uh, I did, and John, David Johnson Davis, DJD, gave me the job. So there I was, coming to Cambridge at age, six, age 18. Um, so initially I worked on the Acorn Atom compilation packs, and there are some around. I've seen them around here somewhere, but I can't know, don't know where they are. I don't have any of them, but I have various other props of other games I wrote later. Um, but then the BBC Micro development kit became available at Acorn, and or Acorn Soft rather. So more accurately, I worked for Acorn Soft, um, which was slightly distinct from Acorn, but initially we shared the same building, and then Acorn moved out to Fullbourne Road, and we stayed in Market Hill behind the electricity showroom down the rather scruffy passage, which is still there. Astonishingly, and it's still got a gating across it, so you still can't get in. That's... And it was initially based on Acorn System 3s, um, and again, I'm fairly sure they're around somewhere. There were a 19 inch Euro rack. In fact, there might be one just there. Is that right? Is that an Acorn System 3? Yes, yes. System 5, right, okay, but it was a later, yes, a variant of the same thing. It had the same Euro bus connectors at the back and so forth. <clears throat> um, having got those with some early prototype BBC micros, uh, uh, rigged up to those, to, to rigged up to the System 3s to do some slightly more, some of the heavy lifting, and then going out to the early Micro Vitec Cub monitors, which we can see around here as well, um, we were able to start writing some games. And so there were three of us initially, uh, games writers, uh, Neil Rain, Tim Dobson, and me. Uh, and the first things we did was we wrote a sprite editor, which pretty much does what it says on the tin. Um, but not many people had done this before, I don't think. But the particular thing was that it produced, uh, it made a memory map of the, uh, the output, so that an easy, easily digestible thing that we could then incorporate into the assembler code. And the multi-file assembler was very useful because it allowed us to write much longer programs than you could otherwise write. So the way it worked is it relied on the disk drive, so it would pull programs in to one area of memory, compile it, or assemble it rather, <coughs> which would go into another block of memory, and it would keep, then it would pull in the next piece of assembler, source code, and compile it, or assemble it onto the end of the previous block. And by pulling these in, successively, you could produce much larger programs. You could have large amounts of source code and produce enough object code to actually make a game. So that was quite a useful utility. Um, <coughs> and so with that, I wrote my first game for Acorn, <laughs> being Snapper. Um, so I had great fun writing that. Uh, initially, we, Neil and Tim and I, went to the local arcades, uh, uh, or rather, there were various of these games around the place, uh, in one in the, uh, the local restaurant, one in the, and various others in the local pubs. And so I chose Pac-Man, Neil chose uh, Defender, uh, and uh, Tim chose Space Panic. But um, so we all used our, the, the same graphic editor, the same sprite editor to produce our sprites, and the multi-file assembler to make the game. Um, yes, and so uh, one of the other things about Snapper that makes it, initially it was just a plain copy, uh, that is a, uh, by which I mean I reverse engineered it, I did it in a, a, a effect like a white room, I didn't have access to any of Namco's source code or anything, I just did it by looking at their, how their games worked and writing it directly again. Uh, but one of the other things we had to do later, as you can see from the image on the, uh, on the badge there, is we had to change the graphics. So I was, 
shortly after it was launched, I was told we have to, I have to change the, the monsters and the, which were ghosts originally, of course, and the Pac-Man character to no longer look like ghosts and Pac-Man characters. Um, I wasn't actually ever told why this was, I, but I presumed, obviously, that uh, the originators of the game had said that's too close uh, and that it was a copyright issue. So I changed it to have the silly green hat and the smiley face and, and I changed those <coughs> the ghosts into little robot-y characters. But they still had the eyes and the eyes were quite important because as you ate each of the ghosts or robots, the eyes would go all the way back to their cave and then they would regenerate as ghosts, uh, robots. <laughs> <coughs> the two things are pretty synonymous, really. Yep, so that was that one. That took me uh, several months to write. It wasn't very long. It didn't take... I remember writing it over the summer of 1982. Uh, <clears throat> shortly after that, we selected some more games. Um, yes, but various, I chose various games. I chose Scramble, which was... And then had a go at writing that. Um, and quite enjoyed doing that, that was quite fun. That had an innovative sideways scrolling, which hadn't been done before. And it mostly worked unless you did lots of things simultaneously. So it would work if it was just drawing the rocket ship and the various other things. But if enough things launched and uh, you've had enough bullets and enough bombs going on simultaneously, the thing started to lose. The, it would take sufficiently long to redraw the screen that it wouldn't do it in a vertical blank period. It had to draw it within the vertical, before the electron gun got to the top of the screen again. Otherwise, you got two images drawn, and then one, and then two, and then one. And you got this jerky effect as a result of that. Um, and one of the other things I did in this game that I, quite, was, I was quite pleased with myself, there was a 6522 as a timer chip. And so, by synchronizing that when I got a vertical sync period, uh, the interrupt from the vertical sync, I could then time the amount of time it took for the electron gun to get all the way to the bottom of the screen. Then I could work out where I was drawing my sprite and I could dodge the electron gun. So I could draw it either above or below, but never while it was on it. So I never got the graphics tearing which is what happens if you try and redraw the graphics while the electron gun is displaying, is, is clocking out the, uh, the graphics simultaneously. So dodging the graphic, dodging the electron gun was quite fun. Uh, the next one I did, <laughs> that's a very young me. <laughs> well, this is at the launch of the, of the game. I can't believe I, anyway, I did look like that once. <laughs> it's very strange. Um, in this one I used the same uh, horizontal scrolling as I did with uh, Rocket Raid, but I also used vertical scrolling, and that wasn't quite so clever. The problem is it was much more memory to redraw. It had to move in blocks of eight pixels, um, which instantly, rather than the two pixels, that it was going sideways. Uh, so one, it was much more memory, and two, it had to move in eight pixel chunks. And I made the mistake, I don't know, later on I saw there was another game that someone else had written, and I can't remember what it was called, it might have been Labyrinth or something, whereby they shrunk the screen a bit, uh, and by programming a 6845 a bit more cleverly, they were able to do horizontal, vertical scrolling in a much smoother fashion. But in my one, I wanted the little digger uh, in the middle there to be able to go up and down in only four pixel chunks. And the problem with this is, if I was having to scroll in eight, it meant it went up one, that was okay, it went up two and then came back eight. So it went up four, eight, back to zero, four, eight. And the end result of this was, it, and so various friends of mine called it JCV Judder. <laughs> <laughs> and I never really lived that one down, I don't think. That was, uh, the game itself was quite fun and um, we were sponsored by JCV, Joseph Cyril Bamford, the people who make the, the diggers. So they paid some of the development costs. Um, but they insisted that the vehicle itself mustn't be destroyed. So the, the various characters, the various baddies that, that were being chased, it could dig, so I could, you could dig holes and you could push them into the sea with the front. But if they caught you, instead of 
destroying the vehicle. Instead, it merely caused the, uh, the driver to be ejected summarily and uh, onto the ground and went splat. And then the, the, the digger would drive off with the meanie on board. <coughs> Just allowing that. Um, oh, yes, the next thing I did is I, I wrote a, a, a book, the one book I've ever written. But I did write it for Penguin. Uh, that's about the only thing I can say, really. It was, um, I've got a copy of it, and I've got various other props as well. Um, and it was all about how to write these multi-file assembler uh, programs, how to do a sprite editor, how to do a simple game, and how to make it more complex. Um, so I wrote that after having written the other three games. Uh, and it was published quite a long while after. So uh, after writing JCB, I looked at the sales figures. I was suddenly discovered the sales figures for a Snapper and worked out that my wage of about 5,000 pounds was about, I could have earned about, I, I can't remember now the actual factor, but it was of the order of eight or ten, ten times as much if I'd been freelance. But I was an employee, so I was just being paid a wage, a salary. So at that point, short, uh, so before this was launched, I wrote most of this whilst at Acorn, Aconsoft, but I then left and became freelance after that and wrote some more of my own games. Um, but then that was published later. Uh, <clears throat> that's one of my games. It wasn't very good. Hopefully no one remembers it, because it was crap. <clears throat> Moving swiftly on. <laughs> I then came back to Acorn um, as a contractor to write, to help them out with the Doomsday Project, of which there's one round the corner. It's very exciting. Uh, laser disc. Um, so some chaps at Philips had uh, worked out how to do data on a laser disc. A normal laser disc was just audio and TV. Um, and they had two types of laser discs. They had the constant angular velocity, whereby you get exactly one frame for one revolution of the disc. So on the inner fragments of the disc, it was quite tightly packed. On the later fragments, it was quite widely spaced. But nonetheless, to do pause, it merely kept the laser head in one place and kept scanning out all 625 lines to come back round again. And the the clever chaps at Philips have worked out that instead of having the audio underneath that, you could, because if you were doing stills, you didn't need audio. <clears throat> instead, you could have 6K of data. So this was their clever bit. They, they added an extra card to the standard Philips laser display to do the data from the audio track. But it only worked on the constant angular velocity disks, because as soon as you went to the constant linear velocity, whereby you had a uh, so at the central, uh, the initial the central co column, central track, track, that's the word I want, isn't it? The central track would have one revolution, meaning one, one TV frame. But as you got further out, the wider, the, the much longer tracks now could hold several frames, which meant you couldn't pause because it would skitter all over the place and they didn't have frame buffers back in those days. Um, and they couldn't do the, the clever audio trick. But that was fine, so they had these two types of disc. Um, and on the Doomsday, the discs next door, you'll see that three of them, uh, they're double-sided. So there are two discs three si uh, with four sides, three of which are constant angular velocity and have data. And I think the other one is film clips, the other, the final one. And that was using constant linear velocity because they could then happily use audio and didn't need the data. And so I, um, yes, for this one, it used the SCSI interface to get the data from the laser disk into the PC or the, the, the BBC Micro. And rather handily, Hugo Tyson had written the advanced disk filing system for the BBC Micro, which did the hard drive for the BBC, which also used the same SCSI interface, the S small computer system, I can't remember what it stood for. Shugart um, Associates was the other Anyway, um, so I took his ADFS and wrote VDFS for Video Disk Filing System. And then it was pointed out that various, 
schoolboys might think it was a bit funny if you had a venereal disease filing system. <laughs> and so it was changed to video, VFS for video disc filing system. And I also did the, because um, of my games bits, I wrote a mouse pointer system for them as well, so that uh, they had a trackball for moving a mouse pointer around. And so, but there was no mouse pointer code on the standard BBC, so I wrote that as well. So that was quite fun. <coughs> then I wrote some more games, and th then I, I th so I'm quite proud of these ones. So um, I know David Braben, and he wrote Zarch, and this is for the Archimedes. Because he wrote Zarch, he said, oh, I can borrow the graphics system. So I did. Uh, and I converted it to show tanks instead, because I rather like tank war games. I play a lot of them with my friend Paul Fellows. Um, we play a little tiny little micro tanks, one three hundredth scale. And I thought, wouldn't it be fun to be inside the tank driving around? And so, and then I, with David's system, I could then actually do this. I, I wrote the, the uh, I put the tanks on, uh, so I, I did the wireframe for the tanks and filled them in, and then had those driving around a landscape that which was very Zarch-like, but I put my own trees and houses on and so forth, and then had other, other tanks, of course. Uh, <clears throat> then I wrote like, another one. Uh, so this is, uh, used the same tank system, but it was based upon maps this time, so that you could link the various battles together rather than just have discrete battles. Um, and then I did change the landscape to be out to the horizon because the problem with the previous system was it was very short range, which wasn't really appropriate for tank warfare. So, uh, oh, no, sorry, it's, it's skip one. Oh. Yeah. oh, yes, there it is. There it is. Yes, I wrote a sequel to the campaign, which had it was then a modern day one where it had helicopters and infantry and everything else. It was very exciting. But then, after that, after that, uh, it was already now the mid-90s, and computer games were no longer being really written by individuals. I quite enjoyed writing the whole thing, designing it, building it, uh, doing all the graphics. And it would take me, this one took me several years to write, but I had great fun doing it. But in the meantime, of course, the games houses would employ 50 people and they would turn it around in six months and it would be much, much shinier than my one. So, after a while, I stopped writing games. Yes, I can no longer do it on my own and compete with the games houses, so I decided instead to write, to become an employee, rather than being a self-employed games programmer, which I did for 17 years. It was great fun. Um, and so nowadays, I write the uh, gadgets, so smart plugs and um, buttons and various other uh, contact sensors and so forth. And these are all Zigbee devices in this particular case. They do short range mesh radio back to a, a, a hub or some kind of base station which you then control. Um, and so that's, that's, that's largely me. Um, that's what I did after Acorn. Uh, <coughs> I don't know what to do now. I've run out of stuff to say. Right, so oh, question. Yes, time. question. Thank you, Jason. Dive in. So the f first one was. Um, so when when you were when you were busy uh, failing your ALS yes. and writing games uh, in in assembler. Um, so you applied for Acon. Did did you have Acon specifically in mind, or did or did you apply for a whole range of companies? No, I actually just. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, I just applied to Acon. Um, a, a friend suggested Acon, and I had an Acon Atom. Um, so I had, yes, uh, and there weren't really very many independent games houses back then. Mm. Um, hardly any, in fact, as I remember. And so, because I'd originally ordered a ZX, uh, ZX80, um, and then the Acorn Atom, uh, the advert for that appeared just before the ZX, the ZX80 was due to arrive. So I quickly cancelled one order. <laughs> Uh, and converted to an Acorn because I thought that looked much better with a proper keyboard and proper basic and everything. And I never looked back. Uh, so, yes, hence, hence, hence the t shirt. <laughs> yeah, and, 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 so, and was it um, 
Or was it very definitely, I think I might know the answer to this one, but I'll ask it anyway. Was it very specifically games that, that you're into uh, for, for programming, or, or, or did you have other interests in, in terms of the, what you were programming, or what software you were creating? <coughs> no, you're right, it was games. <laughs> <laughs> For my A-level, uh, one of the things I had to do was do, as I did computer science A-level, which was the one actually I did sort of pass, but nonetheless it wasn't good enough. Um, but one of their, the thing there, one of the bits there was a, a, uh, a project. And so I did some a North Sea oil drilling uh, emulator, or not emulator so much as a, uh, I don't know how you describe it really, a, a simulator perhaps would be a better one. Uh, so, and again, with that one, I had it so that you would, there was a map of, of the North Sea and you'd put, work out where to put your, your rigs and, uh, and a randomizer would tell you whether you struck oil or not. And uh, I'm not sure the judges liked it very much, <laughs> which is why I think I failed. <laughs> but that was, in some ways, an early game. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, sure. um, so did you play games yourself on BBC? And were there any games that you wished you were involved in with yourself? So yes, I, 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 most of the time I spent my time writing the computer games because I thought that was much more fun than playing them. And various other friends of mine would beat me at my own game, which was always a bit... <laughs> get higher scores on Snapper than I could ever get. <laughs> um, but there were a few, so I did play Elite all the way up to Elite status because I just got hooked on that. So that was a very good example. Um, but I didn't used to play very many other games. I mostly enjoyed writing them rather than playing them. That was, that was definitely my thing. So, um, Snapper, which is a very good game, by the way, very good uh, clone of Pac-Man. Um, and uh, there were a lot of clones of Pac-Man at the time, it's mm -hmm. a very common thing, uh, it, although you could talk to graphics, but there was no other trouble with the, the sort of maze layouts? That was acceptable, was it? I mean, the other thing I was going to ask was, um, were you told to go out and create clone these arcade games, or was this your own idea? Uh -huh. Because, you know, as you said, there was Pac-Man, there was Defender, there was Scramble. That's you know, were, were your bosses sort of knowledgeable that this is, this is what you were doing, or was it just you, you chose it yourself? So, uh, the initial question about the, uh, the layout. Since I'd already adjusted it, because the original game was a, uh, a vertical, they mounted the tube through 90 degrees, and so I didn't have exactly the same uh, layout of the maze anyway. I just made a sort of best I could, squidging it sideways a bit, and, <coughs> having a go. So it was already slightly different, so that was all right. And apparently that wasn't the problem, even though they were all blue outlines and, and bl green dots, just like the original. <laughs> no one seemed fussed about that. Um, and then the other thing was about the, whether I was told which one to do, and no, I wasn't. No, not at all. Um, it, was just, uh, it was just assumed, I think. I don't even remember being told to even write games at all, necessarily. <laughs> I think they just, they just assumed that we would anyway, and, and they were right, we did. <laughs> and we, we would just, in the evenings, we'd go to the local pubs, or, and, or, and or indeed the restaurants, and, and, and see these games around the place, and so we'd play them, uh, and get good enough to be able to go on to the next levels, so that we could work out how it all worked. And then, because it, we could see how it all worked, and we had these new BBC micros uh, with their yeah, development systems, and we'd just written all these sprite editors and everything else, we naturally gravitated towards stealing other people's art. Um, <laughs> not writing our own individual games, which is perhaps what we ought to have done, but instead it was much easier to copy someone else's. It, it seems, from what you said, even though it may not have been explicit, that there was an expectation that Acorn Soft would be releasing quite a few games with BBC Micro. Mm -hmm. Um, what was the attitude towards games when the Archimedes was um, released? Well, the answer is that I'd already left Acorn. <laughs> <laughs> and so I was a contractor. As far as I was self-employed, I could do as I pleased. Um, I didn't, you're quite right, though, that no one within... Acorn Soft had largely disbanded and become absorbed into Acorn. Um, so there wasn't much of Acorn Soft left. Uh, <clears throat> and so... And the, one, the, and the few that were, were largely writing the RISCOS, and, and earlier they'd been writing the Arthur operating systems, um, <clears throat> which is a whole other story, of course. But the, uh, so being a self-employed, I could do as I pleased, and uh, David Braben had done the Zarch thing, um, having done earlier graphics um, on 
He'd also got an early Amiga, and uh, he'd been playing with that, doing these same graphics, and then he did it for the Archimedes as well, and then they put it on a demo. <clears throat> and then, yes, so I, I then took his code and wrote my own game on top of it. Uh, but that's right, so the attitude of Acorn themselves was they were quite happy. They weren't trying to position themselves as a business. Uh, so other people were going for being a pure business, weren't they? So they like PCs at the time were largely focused uh, on spreadsheets and so forth, word processing, not really games. Although very shortly afterwards, of course, as soon as they got color graphics, they got games as well. Yeah. So basically anything with color graphics would soon have a games following, as long as it was cheap enough to be bought by enough people to justify it. I remember when I first got my BBC Micro, uh, getting this sort of snapper and a couple of <laughs> other Microsoft games on set, and being completely awestruck at how can anybody write code that is this good and this authentic <laughs> to the arcade games? <clears throat> and I sort of that was my sort of introduction to computing. But I guess having that introduction via the Atom sort yes. of was probably your your starting point. I think there was Snapper on the Atom as well. So was that something that you were involved in, or is that just a name that you inherited for that game? And thanks for writing the book, by the way, because actually that's what really got me started on being able to make that bridge from writing stuff in basic to writing stuff in machine code. So I'm really proud to write that. Oh. Can I ask you? Yes, there was. There was Snapper on the Atom. You're absolutely right. It was written by Hugo Tyson, uh, who later on did the ADFS. Uh, so yes, uh, Hugo did that. That was before I arrived at Acorn, and he wrote that. Along with, and there were various other games uh, written for the Acorn, um, for the Atom. Sorry, that again. I so I was. In, I wrote some of them. I wrote uh, an early breakout that was on one of the compilation cassettes. But all the individual titles I wasn't involved with. So that there was a there was an Asteroids clone written by Peter Miller, I think. Could be wrong. I think it was Peter. Um, but yes, the answer was I inherited the name Snapper from Hugo, who'd written it for the earlier Atom. And then it was, yes. So, um, how would you say developing for the Atom, BBC Micro, and um, Archimedes compares to each other? Um, so the answer is probably memory. Um, on the Acorn Atom, uh, my initial game was written, uh, the first games I wrote, I only had, I initially I had 2K of RAM, half of which, half of the K rather, was for the screen. And so I had to cram the rest of the game. In fact, I think I only had 1K of RAM. I can't remember. Tiny, tiny amount. And so basically the games were constrained by the amount of RAM I had. Um, and there was no, I just had a, a tape drive, so I couldn't do multi-file uploads. And then later with the BBC Micro, we had much more RAM, but still not a great deal. So I still had to do the multi-file upload to try and actually assemble a big enough program to make it worth doing. And then later with the, with the Archimedes, we had m megabytes of RAM. Ridiculous. Uh, what can you ever do with that? 640k ought to be enough for anyone, as Bill Gates said. Uh, so that was, that was the difference. It was so much easier to develop for the later machines. Um, and ARM assembler was, was great. Uh, it was a lovely, clean assembler to write in. It was, had no silly side effects like uh, the 6502. And indeed, the 68000 was also another odd. That, that was more along the 6502 lines. But the ARM was very nice. I did like writing for the ARM. Um, so these days, if you want to play around with these kind of interesting hardware techniques, you've got the whole of the internet yeah. to go to to find out how to do it. Um, how did you do it back in the day? Mm. Uh, so there were coding cookbooks back in the day. I remember getting, uh, so people would write lots of, um, I remember there being one for the 6502 and another one for the Z80 and so forth. Um, and they would have lots of handy routines for doing standardized things. And I think the, the authors would then, every time a new microprocessor came out, they would churn out another one. I remember Rodney Zacks wrote one for the 6502 that I had. Um, and I used that quite a bit. And that gave lots of quite simple ideas of how to do relatively, well, but nonetheless still useful 
Uh, and then on top of that, we doing the, the graphics, uh, I guess, would be the next sort of stage up, wouldn't it? Um, <clears throat> basically, we just worked it out from scratch. <laughs> I think that Neil and Tim and I combined forces and, and, and played around and uh, decided that we wanted a sprite editor, so we, we wrote one of those. Um, and then we wrote some sprite plotting routines, uh, and it all just sort of coalesced, really. Into a... Yeah, so yes, you're right. Looking back on it, it's quite odd, isn't it? No Google. <laughs> what did we do? <laughs> um, you fancy a return to programming BBC Micros? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, <laughs> modern assemblers and uh, debuggers and uh, emulators. Um, I quite enjoy programming on the Raspberry Pi and various other things like that. I've written various things there. Uh, with my IoT gadgets, I've written myself my own hub to control those same gadgets you know, so that's running in my house at the moment, uh, lighting various lights at various times of day. Based. And yeah, I don't know, about writing stuff for the BBC Micro again, all over again. <laughs> Relearning 6502 assembler. 53 opcodes, how hard could it be? Yeah, well, <laughs> well, later on there were the more with the CMOS one, wasn't there? But I've got a very good book you could borrow. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Kind of a follow up to you, you fancy going back to the BBC. What do you think about the people and the games that they do now? So I haven't seen very many, is it one answer, so, uh, because I haven't really played very much in this scene. I, am, I don't know much about the whole retro uh, gaming, as it were, but perhaps, I, perhaps someone can show me some. There you are. I'm sure there's some willing volunteers somewhere. You mentioned the Raspberry Pi. Yes. And, uh, I'm sure you know it's uh, the risk loss and risk loss open. Um, have you considered, or, or have you uh, programmed uh, things to the risk loss operating system on the Raspberry Pi, I mean, or considered it? Even, right, uh, no, I haven't. I've done it all just with the standard uh, Raspberry and distro, uh, as in uh, standard Linux. Often writing in Python, just because it's easy, and I can uh, quickly knock up something. And nowadays, the microprocessors are so fast that it's really an issue trying to get the speed out. Back in the day, I had to write an assembler in order to get the things to work at all, because BASIC was just so grindingly slow. Do you have the, still have the source code to the Conqueror game that you did? I think I do somewhere on a disk, yes. I think. Crikey. Um, I think I do. <laughs> yeah. I've not, yes, I probably do, actually. And at some point, I had the, I printed out various of my other games, the source code. So I think I might have the snapper source code at some point. Uh. <laughs> but but it's all it's all it's all printed. So in order to yeah, we don't care. Post it all. <laughs> okay, I have to search and find it. Okay, I'll I'll, I'll come along sometime and bring them in. When it came to the graphics on the BBC Micro, did working for April Soft give you inside information? Because the rest of us just had sort of like the normal user guide at that point. The advanced user guide didn't exist. That's right. So all of the 6845 was sort of like a whole unknown world to most of us until that book came out. So just wondered how much help you actually got from the hardware designers. Did they pop in? Did you go and see them? Did they give you some sort of hieroglyphic notes as to how these things in theory could work and, and the tricks that you could pull with them? Uh, so the answer is not very much, no. Um, we, uh, Acorn had already, oh, so my memory tells me, perhaps so it's not true, had already largely moved out uh, up, up to Fullbourne Road. Um, and so largely we were left to our own. We, we did know the, some of the people who wrote the operating system. And again, Peter Miller, I think, did lots of the graphics. And so we did get various clues there, yes. It wasn't entirely. So we knew the layout, the screen memory layout, of course, of the display. But you're right, the advanced user guide, uh, which was written by Mark Holmes and various others, and it was Mark Holmes, who I met in my hometown, who told me to write off to Acorn. So there you go, Mark Holmes appears. He then became a vet, I think. Uh, very odd.
<laughs> the question I have was, I was curious about the competition there, the kids writing Spectrum games, X81 games, Commodore 64. How did you guys see yourselves against the competition, people writing games for the C64, the Spectrum, etc.? Did you have to sort of look out for them and say, now can we go one better, or were you in your own world, as it were? Just curious. So um, the Commodore 64 mostly came out after we'd written all our games, uh, or at least those early ones. And so uh, we weren't, hadn't had, didn't have them to compare ourselves with. And the other machines that were available, such as the ZX80 and 81, and later the Spectrum, were all had much l less complex graphics. And so our graphics could always beat them, just because we weren't limited in the same ways. Um, Later on, of course, the Amigas and Ataris, the 520s and so forth, came out and they were vastly better again. Each generation would leapfrog the next. Um, but initially, the, the Sinclair machines weren't, weren't as complex as, our, as the BBC, so we could easily win just on that, just on visual effect. <laughs> so we, yeah. So, uh, thank you very much, Joe.